Uh, welcome to another edition of What the Fuck Happenings Here in Mendham. Mostly. Uh, in spirit. Uh, I am what I am, from where I am, and such. Anyway, alright, um, uh, topics. Uh, been thinking, <laughs> thinking more just about how the whole thing is pretty simple and it just has to do with a simple change in perspective. So there's people who believe the universe is run by quantum mechanics, let's say, and everything is in some sort of superposition and there's all kinds of magical jumping and changing and time is a dimension and you can bend it and manipulate it and do all this, you know, blah, 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 blah. And that um, creates a foundation for what they see as possible and what they can, you know, make up as other uh, facts because they have put those in as ingredients for the foundation of what they understand. I'm coming at it from some other point of view that's more like, um, yeah, we're just bugs. Uh, we really haven't evolved that much. Uh, the game we're playing is still kind of buggy. We're just driven by a bunch of impulses that could be designed. You can tweak them any way you want. You could turn them into anything. We could desire different things. We could be passionate. We could be humping, you know, completely different things. Um, you know, it's just arbitrary little switches in a brain. And uh, that the basic mechanism is bug. You know, it's just it's, it's, it's nothing... There's nothing admirable in the design. It's just fish eating fish, um, just steel, cheat, survival of the individual who cares about productivity, efficiency, function, um, be a menace, be a slob, be a pig. That'll probably get you somewhere. Get your prodigy a head start. If you can steal a head start, it's good for your prodigy to steal one. All that kind of crap. Um, and there's just nothing about this whole slop that really makes any sense. And uh, it's only silly, superficial, trivial people that play the game with any enthusiasm. Yeah, it should be back. All right, so anyway, so I guess the point <coughs> I am trying to make in some way um, is that there's so many different ways to argue this and so many different places it starts from or it gets to it or so many ways to change some element of what people believe but do you need to change more than one element you know because they have gingerbread men and they have this and they have that you know they have you know candy land people and you know all the <clears throat> the structure that they've built and how many of those pieces do you have to knock out before you can build any kind of you know I would argue the the rational perspective the correct perspective that enables you to see all the rest of it kind of obviously and kind of overtly and you know it's it's almost like the vegetarian argument I mean once you see it there's no going back I mean I know there's people that go back but it's because they didn't see it in the first place <laughs> they were vegetarian for all the wrong reasons um, but, you know, I mean, once you know that what you're doing is stealing the comfort and the welfare of some other feeling organism to gratify what are pretty much superficial dependencies that you've acquired, bad habits, and then all you have to do is change the bad habit. You know, you don't have to do much <clears throat> to, you know, in some sense, at least separate yourself from being a menace. Uh, overtly a menace. Uh, you still can't help being part of the society that's creating the industries and doing all the rest of it and you end up facilitating it in some other way. But the point is, is you don't have to directly be involved, um, as directly involved. And those decisions become so obvious and it becomes, you know, just not, not something you sit there and waste time saying, well, what if I'm wrong? Well, no, there's, there's just no possibility. There's no room for it as a possibility. Um, you know. So, uh, and then what are you allowed to do once you know something's right or wrong is probably another argument to have about, um, you know, were people wrong and evil when they built an underground railroad to save slaves? I mean, was that evil because it was against the law? <laughs> you know, um, 
you know, it's, it gets to be kind of a ludicrous argument that where you're allowed to take a stand and say, yeah, I'll go no further or I'll accept no, you know, I'm not going to live with it. I'm not just going to accept whatever the dopey society does and just play along. No, I'm going to fight it. I'm going to resist. And some of that resistance might require a law to get broken. So what? Um, <clears throat> that's the price of us being individual brains capable of adding up 2 plus 2. And uh, clearly in my context, I would argue <clears throat> that all social decisions are retarded because they're just so compromised. I mean, you can't do anything because the yins don't like the yangs. You know, the <laughs> the 50% of the greedy scoundrels and the other, you know, um, liberal lunatics, I mean, these two people can't even, even if they had power, they couldn't do anything good with it. And when you mix the two, you don't really get anything good either. I mean, it's even worse, you could argue. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, it's a... Yeah. I don't think it could be worse than draconian either one of them, you know, so mixing them can't be worse. I can't, you know, it's probably not correct to say that. Um, but in some cases, yes, it's case sensitive, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, how worse or bad uh, and what a mess it is. And so why shouldn't I uh, do everything I can to manipulate the system or manipulate anything I can manipulate to um, save life on earth from the menace of being um, having their destiny decided by chaotic stupidity <laughs> you know just overt ignorance and the ignorance that comes out of uh, mixing two things that don't mix so um, yeah well I'll get to it with the comments um, but yeah that's the <clears throat> so a piece of this argument. Now the other piece of it is, uh, I might as well put that up now, uh, the uh, Anti-Natalism International, so the, the big tent um, organization um, that it will attempt to do something constructive in terms of getting the message out and organizing and whatnot, um, which is all good. Um, but I guess I would argue there's a lot of bad in it because it's, you know, too big tent. I mean, it doesn't have that grounded philosophy for what you build this on. So it's like having a vegan organization that just doesn't care whether you care about animals. You know, if you're just a show vegan, like, oh, it's good for my health, or, you know, it gives me a shiny nose. Um, you know, whatever. Um, you know, those are very different vegans. The ones who are dragged to it by some ethical obligation and those dragged to it by some logical understanding that, um, they are going to benefit personally from this change in their habit. Um, those are very different ideologies. And uh, you throw them under the same tent with the same cause, and I think you'll make a mess. Uh, but regardless, that's just another one of my opinions. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm not as invested, let's say, in attempting a group think that's based on anything other than um, the right foundations. Uh, you know, if you're joining for the wrong reasons, then, you know, yeah, I'm not going to be part of the club. Um, but anyway, uh, that aside, like I said, it's, it's better than nothing. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, so link below uh, to the website. So it's, it's, it's their um, first project, uh, production piece, let's call it, or something. Their first statement as an organization, mostly their first statement. Um in terms of uh, activating or whatever the right terminology is for whatever they're attempting. Um, part of it is a film festival, different things that they're going to, they have organized, which are all good ideas. I, I think uh, the real, you know, just as a practical matter, I've always thought about um, the fact that the only way to really do this is to have some sort of, you know, to do what the religions do. You have to advertise. Um, and, uh, obviously they do it, you know, on the dole, so to speak, you know, <laughs> based on some sort of, um, business advantage. Um, and you sort of have to do that, I suppose, as another part of this. And, um, but the real evil is, is to get into any kind of, um, advertising mode, you end up endorsing a capitalist system, you know, you end up playing the game that's feeding all the bad 
infrastructure that exists and that's the tragic part like to you know organize um, try to get people you know to financially invest and um, you know for the purpose of of expansion and uh, education if that's what you want to call it um, and uh, yeah you end up financing an awful lot of bad things uh, so I thought of it on a small scale just making commercials you know I can do that a 15 second commercial 30 second commercial half hour commercial you know just make a bunch of various pieces that attempt to uh, invite somebody to learn more you know give them some reason to think there's a reason to care and be interested and uh, to see if they can make some contribution um, to save you know to rescue the future uh, because you know ultimately that's the whole point is to save the victims to spare the victims and uh, you know that needs to be one of the primary things that's understood that the victims are sitting out there in the future okay and we're going to decide you know how much of their guts are spilled on the street and all that kind of stuff it's their welfare is in our hands and that's just a fact we you know it's just the way the world is built that frankly sometimes the only people that can come to the rescue are people 200 years ago <laughs> you know they were the only people that could have saved the day and if they don't put the superman suit on and do it then no one else is going to and that's just the way it is the power resides with the past as weird as that sounds but that's where all the power is hmm, strange this video just doesn't look quite right but anyway <laughs> yeah P picture is big i could move closer but ooh, that gets strange and bizarre so we won't bother with that all right um uh so where was i before i distracted myself all right, so that's something I've been thinking about. Uh, blah blah blah. I've got to think about it. I've got to do about. That's so uh, doing is always you know, investing time and effort and all that crap is the hard part. So, you know, theorizing is a lot easier. But anyway, um, so I guess that's all I have to say about that. I guess I could say more, and maybe I'll say more, but I'll get to other things. So I'll, I'll read a couple of comments just to point out how, um, you know, people are just so freaking stupid. And, you know, this, this, you know, and that's the really, I guess that's the really hard part is that you're not having, you'd, you'd wish to have this argument or this conversation with people equally equipped to have it. You know, and so instead, you've got to always be thinking, I'm talking to a two-year-old, a three-year-old, a four-year-old. I mean, they're, they're, they really are, you know, still wearing diapers and, um, you know, on their brain. And, and, you know, you've got such a long road to travel in terms of getting them up to speed about any kind of philosophical concept because they're just so lost in just being dumb animals, um, and, you know, it's almost like trying to talk to a horse or something. And you're just like saying, is any of this getting through? I mean, you know, I'm scratching your head and itching your ears. And all you seem to want to do is eat my jacket. You know, I mean, really, none of this is working, right? And it's, you know, if you ever try talking to a horse, it just doesn't seem like they can have any pay attention at all. Like, you know, none. Uh, nice, you know, they seem sometimes very nice animals, but yeah, they just don't seem to be able to pay attention. Anyway, but goldfish are the same way. I mean, lots of things are, seem, seem just as incapable of paying attention. There seems a lot of humans are, um, have this dysfunction. So we can go to some comments. And that's not what I want. What the hell is going on there? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Anyway, um, no, it's what I wanted. I guess it just didn't look like what I wanted when I was looking at it. All right. The one thing is, well, one presumes it's recording the right thing. Okay. So uh, that's what I'll have to assume. So I'll carry on assuming uh, 
it doesn't look as bad as it looks. Anyway, um, so comments. So, so Steve Godfrey, who I wasted a whole video on, you know, the last week, um, just doesn't seem capable of narrowing his, you know, any confinements put on a thought experiment. You know, these are the rules, this is the situation, and instead he just changes the rules and changes the situation. I mean, there's just no point. So I'll just read the first sentence in here. Uh, the personal belief at issue is whether or not there will be suffering. So that's not the one. It isn't whether or not there'll be suffering. So you know for sure something's right or wrong. Uh, this, they're holding slaves. You're right to think slaves is a bad idea. You're going to start making tunnels. You're going to start uh, violating property rights. You know, you're going to break the law. Um, we're in agreement that suffering is uh, factual and inevitable. So, you know, he says it's agreed that, okay, you have a good reason to believe. Um, there's no doubt about the facts that uh, the slaves will be tortured and uh, perhaps killed and, um, you know, there will be terrible human uh, tragic discomfort if you don't act. It's a fact. And so you have the choice, you know, to sit on your chair or to do something. And he's arguing that you can't do anything because it's against the law. <laughs> that's what he's really saying, okay? And I'm saying, well, that's not the thought experiment. We don't really care about what the law says. We care about what right and wrong and what the inevitable outcome is going to be. That's all I can do as an individual human is measure those circumstances. And the thought experiment is pretty much saying, yeah, fuck the law because the urgency of the need is stronger than any social contract. The personal belief I'm inquiring into is your belief that you're permitted to kill one person to save 453,000. I didn't say I was socially permitted to do that. I used kittens as an example, right? So let's just understand. I use something that doesn't have any socially protected rights uh, in any real big sense, any, any solid or rational sense. Let's just put it that way. I mean, clearly society thinks... It's okay to do all kinds of nutty stuff like, you know, save Karen Ann Quinlan, right? Her, she's brain dead, but we're going to save her and keep her alive for 10 years. So, I mean, society does lots of, has an insane notion of saving life, um, where it just squanders millions of dollars uh, that could have saved many lives and just throws it in the garbage can. So, um, you know, this whole, this whole rhetoric you want to use um, about this word kill or spare, I could say, I want to, uh, you know, um, gracefully end their pain, uh, or I want to euthanize, you know, you could use lots of different words, but it's your choice, you know, to do this kind of slop. Um, but regardless, the point is still, so you know for certain you can kill one now and save 453,000 from the same fate, some bad fate some fate worse than the one getting killed, which is the irony here too, right? So you're doing something less harmful to one to prevent something more harmful to 453,000. So that isn't supposed to be a compelling enough reason to do something. So unlike rescuing slaves, which I would argue doesn't have those great odds, okay, it's not even, not even, not even close to being this perfect. Right, because even if you rescue a slave, what life does it have, you know, as a outlaw um, in a society that the rescuing society doesn't have that much more respect for the slave than the society they're saving it from. So let's not be too silly and think that the rescued slave is going to have a wonderful life um, as a poor person with no means, uh, you know, that's free, free to starve as a free man. Um, you know, it wasn't that great a deal. Let's understand. This is a great deal. So he's saying it's, it, he, he would probably say that, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> Jim Brown and different people, they did the right thing. He wouldn't argue they did the wrong thing or made the wrong decision, that there was a cause worth fighting for. He, I don't know whether he would think we shouldn't have stopped Nazi Germany. I mean, because that's all he's doing here is saying, what right do you have? 
Well, I'm saying you do have a right. Now, you're just saying that you have to jump through these certain bureaucratic hoops before you can qualify your right or some other kind of crap like that. And that's really not part of the thought experiment. So what's the point of it? So you're, you're telling me I have to have a great deal of respect for the Borg and its social contract. I'm saying as being anti-Borg, that's already established that one of my philosophical premises is the Borg sucks. Okay, and yes, I'll do anything, you know, I'm not for um, breaking laws to fix laws. I'm for doing it within a system. But if you can't do it within the system, then yeah, I'm for people digging tunnels and saving slaves. So, you know, <laughs> you know, this minutia you want to apply to a rational thought experiment that people have lived through. This isn't like it hasn't already happened, that people didn't have to make these decisions in their life whether they're going to become a social enemy, you know, and that they're going to be a target, and that they're going to fight for a cause and risk going to jail or do something else. Of course it comes up. And of course it's happened. And, um, you know, you're saying that all the, these people who acted on their own volition um, shouldn't have, that they all should have just sat on the fence and that would have saved the world. And I'm saying, no, I like some risk taking. I like some violation of the rules. Okay, I don't know how much of it I would like, but I like some of it. And so you want to get into that incredibly nuanced conversation in a circumstance where, again, the thought experiment was, you are Superman. You're the only one who can save the day. If you are sit on the fence all the time, then nothing gets done. And that's the simple truth of it. And so this is just a, a, a silly contextual argument about the battle between what is truly right and the social contract and how sacred the social contract has to be. And I would argue that it just, you know, frankly, in the circumstances we're in now, it's hard to have any respect for the social contract, frankly because you can see how exploitive and, and useless um, the social institutions have become. Uh, they're, just, they're just bastions for privilege. Even the unions have become the privileged class and are only acting not to rescue the working man, but to rescue themselves, to create a privilege for themselves. They have become the enemy, not the defender of justice and decency. So, fuck you. I mean, this is, you're just, you're, you're just so incapable of, of putting this argument in any kind of rational context. And so there's just no point in having the conversation with you. So, yes, you can go ahead and call me a social contract violator, call me all kinds of things. The fact is I haven't done any of these crimes you're saying I committed. Um, but regardless, I'm saying that if the circumstances, if push comes to shove and I have this in balance, if this is what's truly in, at balance, I'll do it. So I'm just letting you know if this circumstance ever arises where I can do one tiny thing, okay, and I can create a huge positive change, and the risk is I go to jail, well, I'm doing it, jackass. Okay, I'm not going to be afraid to act. I'm going to save the future. You can sit on the couch and be an asshole, but I'm going to rescue when I can. That's a fact. <clears throat> um, and I really don't give a fuck whether you like it or don't like it. <laughs> so too fucking bad. Um, stop me if you can. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Give it your, your, your best sit on the couch effort. I bet he wouldn't have any apprehension about pre-arresting people based on thought crimes. You know, so he will act, you know, to defend the social contract. You know, he'll act aggressively against somebody's rights to um, their uh, ideology and beliefs. You know, he'll probably be just fine throwing me in jail because I would act in this circumstance. And he would just sit there and say, I don't, I, I, even though I know it's a fact and even though I know what the outcome is going to be, I'm just going to sit on my couch and be an asshole. Oh, it's just too stupid. But anyway, there is more stupid. I mean, more... You, you, know, just, you just read these comments, it's just so depressing. Um, it's, some of it is just so stupid. So, you, so you, you, you make a video and you point out how by killing one cat today, 
I can prevent all of its prodigy. That is, you know, one cat can, you know, because of circumstances. I mean, it happens here all the time in the sense you can see the evolution taking place. You can see what one male does, you know, in the sense that a cat will have a certain characteristic. And now all the cats will have that characteristic. So it's like all the cats around here, like 80% of them, all have short legs and are generally black and white. You know, that's the tendency. Uh, and, um, you know, it's because one male dominated the neighborhood, you know, and so there's just all these cats have his structure, you know, his build, <laughs> you know, most of them. Um, and, you know, you can just see how, yeah, it's all about this one, you know, one, one key individual cat, you know, has a whole legacy. And the, the simple argument is, is that, yes, the, this reproduction thing, this expanding population thing is completely sometimes dependent on just one incredibly fertile female, you know, one very good mother. And she saves a lot of her kittens, you know, a high percentage of her kittens reach maturity. Um, and so it's theoretically possible that in a few years you have, you know, a huge expansion in population just created by one cat with these right characteristics. Um, but anyway, so the point was is that I kill one cat today, I euthanize it in a perfectly benign way as possible, and 450,000 cats don't live. I'm rescuing them from existing. And that is cl the clear argument made in the video is that I'm saving 455,000 cats from existing. And this idiot writes, if you kill one cat and save, save 453,000, logically, that <clears throat> the mess is much bigger. Because he's thinking I made 453 more cats, 50,000 more cats. That's not what I did, okay? I eliminated 453,000 cats existing. So anyway, he's going out to the cats kill mice and all the rest of this stuff. Obviously, none of those mice would be in jeopardy, and then there'd be too many mice, and whatever other argument you can make. I mean, obviously, none of this happens um, perfectly efficiently, okay, because of all these side effects. You know, one thing affecting other things affecting other things. So you do have to think through all those permutations, of course. But the fact is, is I prevented them existing, idiot. So we can't even get the premise of what's being saved correct. I mean... It's just so bad. He also said some other stupid thing here. Let's just read this one. Uh, why didn't I throw the yacht? Selfishness is part of my evolutionary past. So isn't that just a bizarre statement? I mean, obviously, all the people who are talking about being human and what it is like, uh, you know, we're having conversations about what people sh can are capable of thinking, you know, not what we ate, 10,000 years ago or how well we dressed or any of this to say that you have some evolutionary past that limits your capacity to do logic is just so idiotic I mean it's just idiotic you can talk about you have a feeling you know I have feelings well are we talking about your feelings or are we talking about your thoughts you could want to rape a woman does that mean you're incapable of understanding hey pfft, that's outrageous behavior that's really rude I won't do that I mean, you can have the urge, you can have the need to fart, let's say. And, but you control it and you say, well, I won't fart here. I'll wait till I'm walking and I can just, you know, make my fart dissipate across the, you know, a larger area and be less offensive. I, I mean, you, all the time you can figure it out. So this, this crap that I can't get past, my evolution tells me I have to be an asshole. No, it doesn't. That's idiotic. Uh, you know, it's just so idiotic. It's, it's, well, it's laughably idiotic. Um, it has helped me and my, uh, let's see, primate, primate ancestors to survive. I mean, it's, you really think so. What it's done is it's created competition where maybe the best didn't win all of those battles. Maybe you killed a much better primate. Maybe one of your dopey ancestors got lucky and killed a, a really smart primate. You know, by sneaking up behind it and just whacking it. Okay, not a fair fight, not an evolutionary battle of any significance, just a, a, a victory by opportunity. Um, maybe that's the fact, asshole. 
And so you degraded functionality in a huge sense. You weren't, you're not the you know, master of the universe. You're the blight of the universe. My ancestors formed a, <clears throat> in groups and worked together, right, to murder other groups. That's the actual facts, idiot. The Native Americans weren't living in some paradise before we showed up. They were doing exactly what we do. We would kill everybody. Anybody who said, do you believe in this book? Well, if you don't, you're dead. I mean, you know, come on. You're just so delusional uh, for their own survival. And again, you think that was logical and, and sensible. That it was sensible for the Europeans to come over, you know, across the ocean and basically kill people who were their brother and sister 15,000 years ago. I mean, they have the same lineage, the same ancestors, the same grandparents, and they just start slaughtering them. So, you know, your nieces are, should be targets, your, your nephews and your nieces are, well, yeah, they're a little evolutionary distant, so they should be my enemies and I'll kill them. Uh, evolution only works, I see, it's just too stupid. It doesn't work, idiot. It's survival of the most evil, the stupidest, the, the, the cretin. I, I mean, this, you know, again, your, your whole understanding of the evolutionary process and how imperfect it is in defining a great gladiator. Great just means you're Trump, you inherited or something. Great doesn't mean anything. Oh, you're so stupid. If some win and some and a lot lose, I'm not saying it's morally right. Well, you're defending it as being any kind of right. It's not right in any way at all. There's no evidence it produces, you know, what you would call the perfect organism. I mean, how many organisms out there are a mess like we are? I mean, there's some that look like real perfect machines. You know, I'll, I'll point out tigers and such. I mean, they're just... You'd almost say there's nothing you could fix on that thing. But there's lots of stuff walking around like elephants or something. We see, gee, that's a pretty broken piece of crap. Anyway, but it does increase my chances of survival. So more of this horse shit that some notion that I, it, being a moron is helpful. Well, certainly it's helpful in the sense that if you want to break a system, okay, a merit system, that's the way you break it, is to say it doesn't matter about merit. We're not going to have a horse race. We're just going to let every, all the horses eat each other's feet off. And, you know, the horse who can eat the most feet wins. Um, how does more people increase my chances of survival? I don't even know what this means. So I don't even know if I want to bother with the rest of this. It's so stupid. How does more people increase my chance of survival? You have some, you, you really think there's a risk to your survival created by anything called society. I mean, that's just too stupid. Uh, say your child is sick and will die without uh, proper medication. What if the medication was too expensive and the pharmacy staff, well, what if the disease your kid has or the problem is genetic? then frankly you're ruining their your prodigy you're sentencing it to death by saving your child frankly uh, with bats in their heads told you no if you had a machine gun and you your natural instinct kicked in in the staff would all be dead so and you're thinking that's logical I'm, I'm arguing pretty much that yeah it's it's right to go postal but you have to do it at the right time. You don't go postal for trivial shit. I mean, self-interest shit. You have to have some purpose and you have to know somehow that your prodigy is going to cure cancer or something before you start killing other people to save your kid. That's just too retarded. Um, that's because you would selfishly protect your child. Right, whether it's the better child or not. You'd kill somebody else's better child uh, out of selfishness because you're just a nepotistic retard not, not because you have good reason not because you did any logical thinking so the very thing our brain that makes us distinctive as an organism and has advanced us from you know sticks and stones um, is the very thing you're denying it doesn't have to function properly uh, I would argue that it functioning properly was it doing logic and being able to figure out that um, you know, 
throw a rock in the air, it comes back down, it might hit you in the head, you know, you gotta move your head so the rock doesn't hit you, you know, that this being able to figure out how the world works is the essential part that gave us this advantage. And the brain didn't, we don't have a big brain so it can figure out how to be a selfish asshole. We have, the big brain exists so we can do exactly the opposite, so we can overcome our natural impulses, so we can moderate our, our um, emotions. That's exactly what all of it is engaged in every time. That's all that, you know, you become an asshole when you get drunk. You don't become an innovator and a brilliant scientist. You become an asshole because you're disengaging the very function of your intellect. You're separating it from your impulses. You're, you know, when they say breaking down your inhibitions, those inhibitions are your intelligence telling you, don't be an asshole. Don't be stupid. So you just don't see. So you have just you have no foundation upon which to build a philosophical view of the world, and yet you you write this stuff as you as if you've thought about any of this crap, and you've done so in such a trivial manner that you have the vocabulary, but you don't have understanding of any of the concepts. You don't know what evolution is really doing. Uh, you're stupid. Okay, I disagree. I would do nothing because murder is morally wrong. So it would be wrong to murder somebody who you knew was on his way driving to uh, to go murder his wife and children. So if the only way to stop him was to shoot him, you wouldn't do it. You'd just say, oh, that's not my business. <laughs> you know. I'm just, so you're just telling me that yes, you're not a hero. Uh, okay, uh, I think I would be. I I think my tendency is to be motivated, to be compelled by um, good reason, and to try to be a good person, try to do the right thing. If I can, do, if I can make a circumstance better, and it's going to cost me some skin, um, I'm probably going to say, go ahead, take the skin. Now I don't see myself, you know volunteering to have a bunch of people steal my organs you know to save their lives or something you know there's places where I'm going to say it doesn't make enough sense there's not enough of a value increase for me to accept the value decrease of you know my own um, comfort uh, so I'll certainly draw lines on how much skin I'm going to give um, but like I said when it's oh when it's a when there's a lot of when it's clearly a huge disproportion between the degrade in my welfare and the upgrade in other people's welfare or other animals' welfare, well, then I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to try to, you know, with that building's on fire and the little kitten's sitting there going, meow, meow, meow. Uh, I'm going to try to do something. Uh, yeah, it's going, to, it's going to happen. I'm going to try. Uh, but anyway, ugh. Alright, so some of this stuff is just trivial, so we won't bother with the rest of it. <laughs> Sorry, the rest of you. Um, but yeah, it's just too too irritating. Uh, people are just, just, they're just not, yeah, they're just not equipped to have the conversation. That's what it comes down to. They don't have enough of a foundational understanding that's coherent. And certainly we don't. I mean, I could argue that, I mean, I have already processed a ton of the world. And I've already established a whole bunch of signposts, a bunch of uh, facts. And um, there's just no other way to see it based on those facts. There's no other, you know, and you can't, the fact that you can't see that because you don't see the values of these signposts. You don't see the understanding of the fact that all the failures of the past had common ingredients. And I can understand those common ingredients and understand that, yes, the couch sitters, the people sitting on chairs were always a big problem. The people with their wishy-washy fence sitting, their, their, I don't want to even know there's a decision to be made. Um, they're a real menace. And um, so there's nothing to admire about um, you know, that. 
Now, I also fully understand that there's lunatics who think, you know, they talk to their dog, they got this great advice, you know, God told them they have to go kill abortion doctors or something. And, um, but I would argue that even all of that can be dissected to understand that they had every reason to believe, okay, that that kind of, that uh, 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 action based on faith and not based on reason. So they could understand perfectly. One of those guys, one of one of those idiot Christians killing abortion doctors could understand that he doesn't want Muslims flying their planes into our buildings. You know, he doesn't think they would have the right to do that. So why does he think he has the right to act? If they're not allowed to act on their belief that Mohammed is the true Messiah and we have to kill the Jesus Messiah people, why is he allowed? You know, and, and so you can understand that, yeah, that's not going to work. There has to be a higher standard for why you act. <clears throat> All right. And I, <clears throat> I guess I'm arguing that I could always defend in a court, okay, my reasoning. And that I didn't commit any errors in my reasoning. And that they can't <clears throat> demonstrate any of that kind of hypocrisy where I would tell somebody, well, no, if you got the, the, if you got the understanding that you need to act based on, you know, not talking to your dog, not talking to gods, okay, <laughs> and not putting words in God's mouth, even worse, but based on some real equation that just has to do with the fact that suffering exists on earth and that you have a choice to either stop it or not stop it, I can't deny that person um, the reasoning that compels them to act unless there's some, you know, obvious fact that what they'll be doing won't solve the problem. It'll just create um, a bunch of... Um, negative consequences whereas the the side defending whatever you're attacking will become stronger they'll raise more money their organization will get um, better financing you know it's like if, if you kill the head of the NRA or something you know some kind of wacky thing like that you could understand that the NRA just gets stronger All right so making mortars mortars martyrs sometimes it's very dangerous so you could argue that logically it's not going to work but if I give them a thought experiment, this is clear, you know, where, yes, the value of acting is clearly decisive and it's clearly going to make the future a better place. Why would I argue against somebody acting on their best judgment? Anyway, um, I will right, we'll take a pause and then I'll decide if I need to say much more uh, besides, you know, and just, you know, get back to the whole idea of doing, you know, more rather than saying more, um, trying to compel people uh, to find the, the mechanisms of compelling. Uh, it's now almost nine o'clock, actually, so the premiere, the mm, event video should be up pretty soon. There premiering now. See, it's early. So we could go check that out. It is with great pride that I present to you the amazingly talented A.K. Hunter with his song, The Sun. Take it away, Ash. Okay, well, it's a little bit uh, too on purpose, but whatever. I'm probably not going like this. <laughs> I'm kind of, you know... Artist, smartest. Uh, it's, it's, it's a difficult business. I heard this before. Right, it's not exactly uh, direct enough for my taste. Uh, but that's all music is like that, right? You never even know what the hell they're talking about. So that's a common theme in all music. So, yes, blah, 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 nice, good performance, thank you, blah, blah, blah. I don't know, I should be more enthusiastic. Um, but yeah, I like this, you know, frankly, it's it's nice uh, background music for, <laughs> you know, depressing uh, images, so it is good that way. Yeah, you know, it's, it's good. Play it at my funeral. 
Uh, you know, it's, it's a depressing bit of music. Uh, anyway, um, where the hell was I? Oh, yeah, so we'll just wait and see if there's more stuff. I guess we get hit. No, there's no live. Skip ahead. Okay, we can skip ahead. Yeah, the quality's a little fudgy. I mean, they did this blue screen thing, which they're not blue screening to anything in the background, which is also a little strange. But whatever. See, I can't really... I don't ever fall into much anymore you know it's like when you watch movies and stuff you're always like there's you're sitting there and playing along for a minute you know and then you start analyzing their hairstyles and their makeup and, and you start saying well how did they do that effect and how did that affect you know and then you start thinking about the camera angles and they're switching the camera angles and you're saying you know you just you know, I just, uh, it does sort of get in the way, I have to say. So that's another liability of maybe age or um, you know, perspective. It's just that, yes, you do start to do, you know, <laughs> it gets harder to just go along and um, um, absorb the, what exists as it's intended, you know. You just can't do that. And because everybody else is doing it, yes, it's popular culture. It's part of the pop culture because most people aren't looking at it that way. We aren't seeing all of that. ...that he did recently, uh, just released today, as well as Ash's new album, uh, No Child Left Behind. So make sure to go check out um, the YouTube channel and subscribe for that as well. Thank you so much again, Ash. And now Lawrence is going to tell you a little bit more about Antinatalism International and all of our objectives. Uh, yeah, thanks, Amanda. So I'll go uh, just really quickly, briefly over what Annie is, and then more. Um, we'll go more into our objectives in a minute. But um, so basically, Antinatalism International is the world's first international organization that is sent. Annie isn't a very good name, <laughs> but anyway. Uh, A I A. I didn't even look to see what the abbreviations would mean. I wonder if the chatters are saying anything useful. No. I mean, what would you expect? Chatters. Centered around this increasingly popular um, philosophy um, of antinatalism, essentially, you know the. Um, the rejection of procreation on ethical grounds and um, Annie welcomes uh, anti-procreative thinkers from uh, all regions of the world and all schools of thought uh, and as an organization Ali really wants to play um, a yeah certainly <clears throat> yeah see I would call that's just the whole anti-natalism thing anti-procreation blah 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 you know the bottom line is it's life that's the broken part um, the fish eating the fish eating the fish and just doing it over and over and over again the redundancy and it's a redundant fail game you will fail you will fail to, to survive your life your life will you will not succeed you will fail to survive it and uh, it's just a a game where everybody loses and um you know obviously you know people do there's there's little cases where people live their little crappy shitty life they don't do anything they don't experience any great harm and then they drop dead of a heart attack or something so yeah there's some people that get off easy but generally speaking for 99 percent of all the organisms on earth it's a struggle struggle die struggle struggle die struggle struggle die struggle struggle die how could I be pro that? Why would I be pro that? That's really stupid. Yeah, I wouldn't be pro that. Yeah, so I'm just saying I'm anti-life, clearly. That's the, you know, that's the real thing to be, that's the real enemy. Is just this process of being this insanely silly biological organism squandering all of this misery in a silly game of I'm going to steal your shit I'm going to steal your shit yeah. 
how can I use you to, you know, make my light brighter? You know, some kind of whatever, however you want to look at it. A key role in helping facilitate getting uh, and productive reproductive methods. Okay. The creation of new or continuation of existing assisted reproductive technologies and methods. Number eight, steady and research. I have and one of these little clips in here somewhere, I think. Research into issues pertaining to non procreation and anti -natural. So this guy's a, um, <clears throat> he comes from from the perspective of, of minimalism, you know, the, the, the idea of just trying to do the minimal harm and just try to escape your life, you know. Uh, yeah, without doing something tragically stupid, and everything you do is dangerous, and everything's fraught with, um, you know, danger. Um, so yeah, that's admirable. Um, you know, we don't need all this, all of this psychology that the this the pop culture drives, and all of these ambitions are all so trivial. And really, your only ambition should be how can I um, uh, step productively into the world. Objective number nine, encouraging voluntary extension, generating conversations around and encouraging a movement towards voluntary, ethical, human extension and or, or extension of... Mm, kind of like the girly thing, so that's kind of... Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's always... You know, our prejudices always just arise, and you have to say, okay, I'm paying more attention because it's a girl. Oh, well, I shouldn't do that. All sentient beings. Number 10, preventing procreation of sentient beings. Opposing the breeding of all sentient beings and encouraging the prevention of their procreation. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, we want to make it clear that Antinatalism International does not intend to be to act as a spokesperson for the antinatalist community, but instead, you know, we mm. hope to facilitate the community becoming a stronger spokesman for itself. Um, just a quick note that everything above the About section and the Antinatalism International um, 10 objectives are on the website, uh, so please feel free to go check those out anytime. We hope that you go and read them. So when we were yeah, I'll have to go do that. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, it's probably more words than I would use uh, because the objective is pretty clear. Um, life is a bad idea, and um, <laughs> yeah, it's prevent it from continuing. Putting together this event, we thought it would be really cool to ask a few members of our community that age-old question of why are you an anti Ah, oh, this is the part why am I So going? we're going to play the first response we got back now, and that is by the author of, of Happiness and Children. Right. And control ahead. may be difficult, but before you decide to have a baby, think about the risky fate of your living creation. It is something more than you desire. It's a new life and a new death, and a matter of your responsibility. To beget children is a rather reckless decision. I would say it's not... It's always dangerous, and unless you have some explanation for why the danger, okay, doesn't exist, why the risk you're taking of failure doesn't matter, whether it's okay for your car to catch fire and crash into somebody's living room, so to speak, you know, your seed goes demon on you. Uh, you know, it, it, yeah, until you can explain how you're going to fix that, you know, how you're going to fix the bad future you, you're risking, then um, you really don't have an, a right, you know, in the sense of it's just obviously impositional on the world to provide the opportunity for the Frankenstein monster story to be written. Ethical. Preventive because I just don't see the point in this entire exercise. Like even if it was complete Well, I mean wearing this fake Santa Claus beard and everything is, you know, it's a little bit uh I understand, okay. Your neighbors will kill you, so okay, I get it. Pleasure and no pain. What is the damn point? But the fact remains that there is pain and there is a lot of pointless pain for this sentient piece of flesh 
that is eventually going to die for absolutely no reason at all. So even if you die a billionaire, right? The sheer obvious. The the reasoning is just yeah, you can't find it. The the accomplishment, the accomplishment is the same play. Over, I mean, we're just doing the Shakespeare thing over and over. We're all having our little personal life tragedies. And that we're all doing my friend Yurik thing, and we're all just redoing the same play, and all we do is change a little bit of the atmospherics. I mean, there's some different buildings in the background. And instead of stabbing each other with swords, we stabbed each other with love, or you know, some other uh, mechanism. Vast. Take it away, Anubra. To follow along with Anubra's tour, head over to antinatalisminternational.com. Link below. Uh, let me take you to a tour of website and what resources are currently available. Uh, the homepage. Okay. This is the homepage. Uh, you can navigate uh, through different, uh, you know, sections. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is all gets into another part of, you know, what's appealing or not. Um, you know, they ask you to join. You know, first a pop up comes up, and then they have a little robot chat thing, and <laughs> you know. And nothing on here is clickable, which is sort of irritating, right? So it says the YouTube channel. You can't click any of that stuff to actually get anywhere. So the only icons that actually work are the little floaty ones, you know, the little twittery little icons. I guess that's okay. That's very modern. But it's kind of irritating. I would just, you know... Uh, oh, YouTube channel. Okay, click it. Uh, nothing happens. Yeah, kind of irritating. All right, so let's jump ahead. Introduction to ANI, Antinatalism International. We already spoke about objectives. You will find them listed out here. And then there are values. And then you can, you know, look at our, read a bit about the characters that is us. And then you can also follow us on our social media handles. And the next section, what is antinatalism? You get to read about general information, general interaction rather uh, to antinatalism. And then there's a brief overview of four main schools of thought. That's some very interesting stuff. The next menu item that I want to introduce to you is yeah, so, initiative. Here you can find out about our so active this, initiative. Oh, There'll sorry. be much more fun. So that's a kind of a good idea, the film thing, because and so maybe the film thing could be blended into a yeah, films of any length. So if you can do a fifteen minute commercial to inspire people to learn more, um, trigger words, trigger images, all that kind of stuff, some sort of crap that gets people to say Look, this is, you know, a lot is, is at stake here, so be sure you understand. Understand that your life is going to, to be, you're going to be part of, you know, what millions and billions of organisms are sitting there in the future. And if they could, they'd be looking, you know, at you and saying, what are you doing for me? I mean, what, what world am I going to have to live in because of the decisions you made? What steps you took in your life? Because the fact is, I'm going to fall. You know, you're digging holes now that I can fall in and break my leg. That kind of thing. <laughs> I'm depending on you being smart. And um, we're, we're not, you know, we are in that process, right? So it's like, I'm like, you're in the position of your parents. You're in the position of all the things that took place in your life that ruined you, let's say. Um, or ruined your life and you're in the position of creating that world for somebody else and are you doing anything different than the assholes did in your past to create the shitty world you exist in are you doing anything different than they are see but doing that in 15 seconds is really tough <sighs> in the future of course and uh, as you upload it the upcoming event section is the place where you can keep yourself updated of global activities, events that are happening in the antinatalism domain. Thank you, Anubra. Please make sure to head over to antinatalisminternational.com to see everything. Yes. All right, a commercial. Okay, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, the time has come. I would like to introduce to you all our special guest lecturer for the evening. Everyone, please welcome renowned antinatalist historian and the author of several books on the subject most recently antinatalismus ein handbook Kareem. uh yeah the only problem with all this stuff is people are sometimes hard to understand all this multiculturalism Akerma. Kareem will be speaking with us today regarding a variety of subjects related to antinatalism including antinatalist enlightenment the never act rule prime morality and parental guilt 
On behalf of everyone at A&I, our most sincere thanks to Mr. Akurma for preparing this presentation for us all today. And without further ado, I am so pleased to give you Kareem Akurma. Hello, Antinatalism International. My name is Kareem Akurma. I'm... All right, that's pretty good English, so yeah, no problem there. So I'll have to watch that later. Uh, so yeah, I don't know where my little clip was or if it is or whatever. Maybe it's later. Maybe they're saving it for last or something. Anyway, you're hiding it for last. But regardless, doesn't matter. Um, and such. So there, that was a little extra. Uh, for those of you... Um, uh, not as detail oriented i would suggest going and watching the entire uh, video and blah 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 and be informed and up to date on um what's going on and um how different people are becoming motivated and why they're motivated it's all important stuff what arguments work what arguments don't all of that kind of stuff is interesting conversation so go have it somewhere Except here, <laughs> yeah, yeah, because here it's it's about one story, about one set of facts, and it all points in one direction that um, this is just a big pile of waste, and that's the bottom line: waste, waste, waste. And waste is stupid. Wasted suffering is just stupid. So anyway. And there's just no way to do, there's just no way not to be wasteful. I mean, life is just, that's what it does, is squander. It squanders our intelligence. It squanders our feelings. It squanders everything that happens by tainting it with all of this stupid, idiotic pain and misery. Anyway, so till the next time, and so. We can only solve problems our existence creates. It's just really stupid. We can only clean up a mess that's made by our existence. It's stupid. It starts with a deficit. It doesn't start with a profit. You don't get a profit and then lose it. You get a deficit and all you can do is get rid of it. There's nothing else you can do with it except get rid of it undo it prevent it from being inherited <laughs> yeah don't inherit the deficit don't force the inheritance of the deficit okay maybe say it that way so well, anyway all of this word smithing that needs to be done lingos and such and yeah whatever <laughs> We have to have to give it pizzazz or whatever, whatever the word for that is now. Style or vogue or whatever. I don't know what the right words are. Doesn't matter. <clears throat> I don't have to know. Um, so till the next time. And such. Yeah, I think that's enough of a video. Yeah, I think I. Can... Yeah. So I will try to be. Um, I'll try to do something more. <laughs> yeah. But trying just, you know, it's not enough. <laughs> yeah. I have to try it in a different way. Like I spell try a different way and maybe it'll work then because so far my trying uh, is coming up short. Uh, so anyway, I'll work on that.